a couple of years ago, I began serving on the board of directors at DePaul High School Prep uh, High School. And I had not had much involvement with high schools probably since I was in high school, which was a long time ago. I've been teaching at DePaul University for many years, but this was a new world. And one of the things that stuck out to me was, and so many of you know this so much better than I do, one of the things that really struck me is how competitive the schools can be, the testing process, the placement tests, all of that sort of thing. And I began to see things in two different ways. One, now anytime I hear anyone is taking a test of any kind, I pour out my prayer and my love for them. It is such a pressured thing. You may have heard the story at Loyola Law School. There was a woman sitting for the bar exam and went into labor and she finished the exam before she went to the hospital. That's intense, that's intense. The second thing that I also learned was to begin adjusting the way that I do testing or the way that I invite people to understand the material they may have learned and how to actually make sense of it. It had completely changed the way I frame that sort of experience. This image of testing, of course, can come up in so many different ways, but it is clear from Matthew's Gospel this morning, the Pharisees and the teachers of the people publicly in front of everyone are putting Jesus to the test. And it's a test about a very volatile issue and one that maybe you might feel is even familiar for yourself. The Pharisees asked Jesus, are we supposed to pay taxes to the Roman emperor? This was a conquering army. They overran our territory. They have invaded our temple. And now they want us to pay taxes for that privilege. And they're putting Jesus to the test because there's no good answer to that question. If he says, of course not, they are alien invaders, then he could be accused of treason. If he says yes, then he could be accused of blasphemy against his faith. There's no way out of this test. There's no way he could get it right. One thing we also forget in this story is just a couple days before this test takes place, he's experienced his Palm Sunday, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and so everything is at fever pitch. There are people from all over the region in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover at the temple. So you have a cross, uh, cross section of cultures, education, beliefs, ideologies, religions, opinions, kind of like, I don't know, our world today. And Jesus, in front of all of this chaos, is asked an impossible question. And it's so fascinating to see how he answers this question. He says two things to his questioners. First, do you have one of those coins? Indicating he does not. He has not participated in that system that has the picture of Caesar on the coin. So when someone pulls one out, Jesus, in a sense, is directing attention to the fact that there are people who are collaborating with this corrupt system and you need to worry more about them than you need to worry about me. And then the second thing he asks them, whose picture is that on the coin? And they say it's a picture of Caesar. Now you've probably heard before in the Jewish tradition, making an image of any human being or any kind of living creature for that matter was considered blasphemy, and yet they recognized the emperor. In other words, these people who were trying to trip him up were trying to get him to commit an act of treason against the emperor. And then Jesus says the most wise thing that does cut through the impossible question. 
He just says, you have it in your heart, you have it in your mind to figure out what belongs to Caesar, really, and what belongs to God. In other words, Jesus reminds them of a deep truth that I think we really need to tap into these days. Nothing belongs to Caesar. Caesar is an invader. Caesar died. The Roman Empire went away. It was very temporary, even if it was a thousand years, but that's nothing in the eyes of God. Jesus says everything belongs to God. The world, the stars, the universe, wisdom, life itself, and every one of you comes from God. You belong to God, and God cannot be separated from what belongs to him. In the sense, Jesus is invoking those ancient words of the scriptures we heard. Behold, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and there is no other. And so Jesus is trying to refocus. He is not trying to take sides. He is not trying to denounce one over the other. He's asking you to look into your heart, look into your life, look into where you have found strength, where have you found joy before all of this chaos has overwhelmed us. It belongs to God and God will not be separated from it, even if it feels we are being put to the test. In some ways, we live at a time where there is no clear black and white answer. And I wish there was, but I haven't discovered it myself. I'm open if somebody wants to. Just don't Zoom me. I'm a little Zoomed out. But we live in a time where it's easy to forget that this is God's world and that we are God's people and that everyone we see out there is a gift from God, a light from God some sort of wisdom from God, spoken into being by God. We will go on, we will continue, and we will look for God in all of this, no matter what tests come our way. Because at the end, nothing belongs to this virus, nothing belongs to this election, nothing belongs to this universe. Everything belongs to God. And if we can just root ourselves in that truth, Perhaps maybe we can see the deeper possibilities of bringing God into all of these situations rather than leaving God for something that doesn't belong to him.